welcome to this Zero Week conversation for the Innovation Agora, brought to you by IHS Market. My name is Carolyn Cito, and I'm a director in the Energy Technology and Innovation Practice here at IHS Market. In today's session, we're going to explore geothermal energy, and it's having a new revival. So what's driving this renaissance? We're also gonna look at potential obstacles that could challenge it. And how does geothermal energy fit in the competitive landscape of renewable generation? So to explore these topics, I'm joined by a great set of panelists who are leading this charge. We've got Jamie Baird. She's the executive director of the Geothermal Entrepreneurship Organization at the University of Texas at Austin. Tim Latimer, the CEO of Fervo Energy, who's developing next generation geothermal technology and Lise Rodionov, the Vice President of Global Sustainability at Schlumberger. Welcome. So amid growing concerns over climate and sustainability, geothermal energy is well positioned as a 24 seven source of renewable energy. Now, this is not a new technology. It's been around for almost a century now with the first geothermal power plant being developed um, at the start of the 20th century in, uh, in Italy. And we also have the geysers developed in the 60s, which still continue to produce about 20% of California's renewable energy. So I'd like to start with you, Jamie. Your organization connects innovators, academics, companies, and government. So you have a broad perspective of how the geothermal energy industry is evolving. What's driving this renaissance? A few, a few factors, actually. Um, one of them is technology development. And it's been you know, technology development largely in the oil and gas industry that's increasingly being transferred in the geothermal space. So we've had a couple of flourishes of technology development that happened in oil and gas over the past couple of decades that are applicable. Mm -hmm. One of them is the high pressure and temperature developments that happened offshore. Um, this was before the frack boom. So this is now you know, going on 20 years ago, early 2000s. Really high temperature and pressure drilling technologies that were developed in exploratory wells offshore. So we're talking 350 degrees Celsius drilling projects, right? Which is well above what you'd need to produce economical geothermal energy. And when the shale boom happened, um, the operators that were working on these projects um, kind of shelved all of those innovations and, and pivoted into unconventionals. And so then you had a second technology flourish, which was um, fracking and directional drilling that came from um, unconventionals. And so when you take both of those uh, technology sets and capability sets together, um, you have a paradigm shift for, for geothermal and what, what capabilities can be driven by oil and gas technologies. So a lot of the interest, at least coming from the oil and gas sector, um, is a realization that these two things can actually combine to come into play to push the um, industry forward for geothermal. So I want to explore that. I want to explore um, you know, these technologies that have been around the, in the industry for um, you know, quite a while. And they've um, you know, developed the capabilities as well as matured the supply chains. Um, and it seems like the time is right. So it's not just a technology story, but um, what, are the, what other things are driving um, this, this relook at um, geothermal energy? And, um, you know, Tim, you're developing, you're actually in the process of developing uh, a geothermal or a next generation geothermal uh, development. So, you know, what do you see? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think that the big change in the last few years is that people have gotten serious about climate change and also gotten serious about what it's gonna take to get there. And the idea that you would have a system that was powered with 100% carbon free electricity uh, was kind of unheard of a few years ago. And then first with Hawaii and then with California and now many states and also international countries around the world, people are have, putting laws on the books to drive to 100% carbon free energy. And that's a very, very different challenge than what really predominated most of the last 20 years, which was how do you get to a 10% renewable portfolio standard or a 25% renewable mm -hmm. portfolio standard? 
And whenever you think about a system that's 100% carbon free versus 10% carbon free, the technology solutions and the suite of technologies you need to get there are quite a bit different. So we've already seen major technology revolutions in solar, wind, and batteries. And those have been instrumental in, in a lot of states and countries around the world meeting these early low level renewable targets. But now people are for the very first time contemplating what it takes to have a 100% carbon free system. And there's laws like the SB100 law in California that puts a roadmap together to do that by 2045 with very robust intermediate targets as soon as 2030, which is only nine years away, which is a, uh, basically overnight in the world of um, power planning. And it has gotten people to relook at technologies. And what you're finding is that reliability matters whenever you get to a grid with that level of, um, of renewable energy. And where people would have overlooked geothermal before because it was just more expensive on an LCOE basis than a wind or solar technology. LCOE is not the only thing that matters if you're talking about trying to provide a 24 seven carbon free grid. And what we're seeing is the market fundamentals are there where the value of being a 24 seven product is starting to be recognized by buyers and very aggressively. And they, they, a switch is flipped in this market where everyone wants to now have a part of their portfolio that is both carbon free and works any time of the day. So you brought up this concept of energy systems, as well as um, you know, creating or assigning value to um, you know things that we we didn't typically think of or think of as valuable before, having reliability, having system stability. Um, Lise, as a technology provider, you know, Schlumberger provides technology to the oil and gas industry. Um, they su supply um, you know, dis you know, distinct technologies. Uh, uh, now, how does um, this you know, view of a system, you know, how does a view of a system you know, relate to you know, the technology provider? No, it's, um, I think, it would be if you asked me the question that, that uh, both Jamie and Tim just answered. I think this idea of taking more of a system based approach in decision making, where you're not just looking at the, the cost of a widget, as an example, or you know, the capex per installed megawatt, it invites a different discussion. So, so it's uh, you know, Tim touched on a little bit when you talk about delivered cost, but you know, if you roll in the emissions or the environmental impact as well, there's delivered emissions also. So thinking about the whole system and the trade-offs um, along not just operation, but installation uh, related to reliability, as you discussed, replacement, you know, renewal, maintenance, and, and ultimately disposal. Um, geothermal won't win every time. No form of energy will win every time, but you start to create more situations where it's going to win more often when you take that more system-based approach. And from a technology provider uh, perspective, for me, it's not just related to geothermal, but sustainable technology in general. We need a commercial space where you are having that more system-based approach, and not just the cost of the widget, um, to be able to make the, the, the decisions that understand and, and manage around those trade-offs. Mm -hmm. So going into this system-based approach, you know, just following along that um, line of thinking, um, Lise, you know, technology providers were normally, um, you know, providing a single component, um, you know, to really drive the energy transition and to, to make geothermal energy, um, you know, a, you know, something that's, that's going to be, um, you know, a, a, you know, a, a, a growing part or a pillar of the, uh, you know, the, the, you know, carbon free um, energy system, you know, we also have to uh, bring into the equation our uh, technology providers. So this is a bit of a, um, a paradigm shift in terms of how you would develop a project. So, so how is Schlumberger, um, you know, approaching this? I think that um, the, if I draw the analogy maybe with exploration and appraisal, it's it's the, the one space probably for our industry where we do the best job of bringing all the different pieces of the value chain together to um, manage and mitigate and understand risk, um, as well as there's partnership from the customer level to manage risk, but also 
keep uh, access to a, a wide variety or a, a wider portfolio of opportunities. So that's kind of the approach that we're taking with new energy um, is that we're saying, let's not try to, um, from a capability perspective, let's, let's leverage the capabilities that we have, industrializing you know, technology at scale, subsurface, drilling, et cetera, but partner with other companies that um, have their own capabilities. And that way we, we don't um, waste limited CapEx across the industry. We, we uh, fill in gaps in competency through partnership. And at the same time, maintain this, um, like you said, kind of this access to a, a wider portfolio of opportunities while there's still a lot of uncertainty about which one of those, uh, you know, in terms of the the market uh, gets the most traction. So, um, you know, I want to just, you know, we've, we've heard a, a little bit about, you know, where this technology is coming from and the advances are coming from the oil and gas sector. Um, you know, the capabilities are also very well aligned with the oil and gas sector. Uh, Tim, in fact, you know, you started your career um, in the oil and gas sector as a drilling engineer. So, you know, seeing that this is so, um, you know, so well aligned with the technologies and the capabilities of the oil and gas industry, um, you know, another technology that we're hearing about that is gaining a lot of interest is CCUS which has similar, um, has similar roots and has similar history. But why aren't we hearing as much um, interest in geothermal? Um, the supply chains are very well developed. Um, the capabilities are there. The technology is there. It seems like it can be deployed at scale uh, very readily. So why don't we have that same interest in geothermal energy development that we do with something like CCUS? I, it's a great question. And I think that um, in part, you know, the fact that geothermal has been around for 100 years, as you've talked about, is something that's really great for in certain contexts because customers understand it. They understand geothermal power. They're familiar with it. But then the flip side of that is it makes it seem sometimes like an old and stodgy industry. And whenever we talk about innovation or whenever we approach approach partners, I don't know, I don't know, I always have to answer this question. You know, I'm, I'm not only responsible for my company's innovations and projects, I'm responsible for explaining why this technology hasn't scaled and taken off for the last 50 years. Um, and what you've seen, at least in the United States context, is the last time people were really all that interested in geothermal was a little over a decade ago um, in the late 2000s. And there were really, you know, two drivers behind that. Um, Number one was that people believed that natural gas prices were going to be were high and going to be for high for a very, very long time. And so you could get strong power purchase agreements. And number two, the, the, through the ARA Act and other federal government funds, there was financing to build geothermal projects. Um, and that got put into place. And so you got, got this kind of flourish of activity from 2007 to 2010 in the geothermal sector. And some of those projects fell short of their goals. A lot of them were very successful in bringing power on the grid. But the iteration cycles and some of the challenges kept them from being from you know truly breaking out as a scale of technology. And part of that, if you look at it at the time, I mean Jamie highlighted well how important shale revolution technologies are to this new place of geothermal. Shale was just getting its training wheels in 2007 and 2008. And you know you look at the last decade, drilling productivity. If you take like the EIA drilling productivity index, um, horizontal drilling, what, what's done in shale is improved by about 10x in every basin. You know, I, I worked in the Eagleford for a long time doing high temperature drilling work, which is how I got interested in geothermal to begin with. And I remember rotating into that job and us taking 45 days to drill a well, and then 12 months later coming down and, and, and drilling um, in less than half that time. And this technology advancements really didn't even take off at scale with this rapid learning we've associated with shale until the early 2010s. And so that technology, you know, to have a true tech breakout, you have to have the policy support, the commercial demand and the tech all there at the same time. And we just had kind of two legs of the stool back then. And then whenever you look at these companies, I've engaged with all the oil majors, I've engaged with all the service companies. And oftentimes they say, oh yeah, we looked at geothermal and I talk to them more and they'll send me a report on a study in 2008 of what they did of geothermal and not incorporating anything in terms of drilling advancement technologies for the last decade. And the view at a lot of these companies where we've, geothermal is well understood, we've done it before, it's been around for a long time, look, here's a report I'll send you, and you'll see we've, we've taken this seriously. 
And there's not even self-awareness that that report's 13 years old. And that happens often. And geothermal deserves a fresh look. And what we're seeing, I'm talking about the policy and that commercial support and customer demand now. And we need to look at it again with the fact that these technologies we have that have enabled the shale revolution and major tech advancements in oil and gas are now ready and mature and can be applied to this sector. And we didn't have that the last time people took a serious look at it. So I think we're going to get there, but we're always dealing with this legacy of support. And until people dust off their old studies and update them with 2021 performance and what we can now do in the subsurface with modern technology, people are going to miss the boat on this. And, and that's what's most important now is looking at this with the lens of new technology capabilities. Mm -hmm. I just I want to follow up with a, a quick comment about, about that too. One thing that, that you'll notice also in big oil and gas entities, something that I've noticed in engagement is it takes a long time for companies of that size to have a eureka moment. I mean, you can have one employee or you can have 10 or you can have 50 that all have eurekas and it still doesn't even move the needle in entities that are gigantic and multinational, right? So it really does take a critical mass of people pushing within an entity to even get traction, to, to get things re-looked at and reanalyzed. And you're seeing that happen across multiple entities now. It's been happening for the past 18 months or so. And you're just now starting to see entities come out and make investments and make public statements and get out in there and start talking about geothermal strategies. But this has been in the works for almost two years. That's how long it took the entities to move and start talking. And so I think this is also, it's just, it, it, it goes to how nimble startups are and how slow, very big, uh, multinational entities can be, you know, it's a, it's a big ship to turn and it's a little slower than I think we, the startup people in the world would, would wish, would wish for. Yeah, that, that's a great point about having there be a paradigm shift because with the, the unconventional revolution, there was a paradigm shift that these new technologies enabled in, you know, instead of having to work with the reservoir that you have, you could actually engineer the reservoir to give you the productivity that you want. And I think there's a similar analogy happening in geothermal energy development. Instead of enhancing the geothermal reservoir, you can actually engineer the geothermal system to give you the flow rates uh, you know, that you need for the energy that you want to produce. So, with this change in mindset, um, because the industry has been primed a little bit with the unconventional revolution, do you see that, um, that, that ship turning a little bit faster, Jamie? Of course, yeah, no, and the fun thing is when one entity comes out, the ones that are a little bit behind go faster because they feel like they're behind. And you see that that's starting to happen now in, in, in oil service, but also operators and drilling contractors, where you know when one entity goes out public with an investment or with a strategy, you'll have you know, others join in quickly after, as in months after, instead of years after. And that's really exciting um, when it's exciting to see and it's accelerating. And I think that over, you know, we've seen over the, eight, the last 18 months, probably more movement in oil and gas on geothermal than happened in the last decade. Um, and the next 18 months will probably be double that, right? Because there's just, we're, we've got momentum now in industry and now it's just a matter of, of, of watching where it goes and, and helping support that. But it, things are, are catalyzed for sure within industry. Well, and, and I would say maybe more intentionally leveraging industry. So, you know, if, if previous activity was centered around surface shows or volcanoes, is instead saying, I'm going to target a, an oil and gas basin, and then I can leverage infrastructure, I can average, you know, leverage supply chain, I can have leverage the, the expertise, both from an execution as well as the design and the, you know, the subsurface, because I think that, um, you know, there's still opportunity, even though there's been advancement in, in if you can do better at subsurface characterization and drilling and, and take costs down further, as as you're, you're riding the wave of that, let's shift to that system-based cost analysis. But in the near term, there's still going to be what is the installed cost is that if you can attack the cost by leveraging you know, that, the industry more intentionally, um, I, I definitely think there's opportunity. Absolutely. I to totally agree with that. I, and it's you know a personal conviction for me that the oil and gas industry really holds the keys to driving down costs of geothermal. And that's, that's subsurface and surface. 
um, just by leveraging things that have been done over the past century in the industry in the hydrocarbon context. And you see that happening in all kinds of ways um, in industry where you do have eureka moments in groups where, you know, it's like, oh, we can do what we did at X and apply that to geothermal. And that's, that's where a lot of the innovation, you, you're seeing startups spin out of oil and gas. You're seeing, you know, 40 year oil and gas veterans starting geothermal companies, and they're all applying knowledge and technologies and methodologies and expertise that was developed wholly in oil and gas. And I think that's, um, that's, that's just really exciting. And it's, it's kind of, um, it's, it's really pushed, you know, push the gas on traction over the past couple of years. And that, that and also we can't um, understate the value of all the media attention geothermal has gotten in the past year. Um, that's really helped engage new investor groups, new types of investors. It's pulled philanthropists into the fray, climate philanthropists. You're starting to see situations where you have, you know, 40 year oil and gas veterans that are funded by climate philanthropy to go and do geothermal projects. That's really cool. I mean, that, that is something that we haven't really seen before in the past. Um, and, it, and that, that has been a result of just geothermal jumping into the public consciousness through some really cool, really thorough um, uh, articles that have been in the news lately, you know, like the Vox article, for instance, yeah. is a great example. Yeah, so actually, Jamie, I want to pick up on that, how you're starting to see new funders and, and new entities coming into geothermal energy. Um, Tim, you know, you just signed or you recently entered into a partnership with a traditional technology provider, um, you know, that we think you, with Google, um, you know, how did that happen? Yeah, it's a great question. And we're very excited about this, this partnership with Google. Um, it, it comes down to some of the same trends we, we talked about, which is Google has always been on the forefront of corporate sustainability. And they were one of the first groups to set a 100% renewable energy target and then achieve it all the way back in 2017. So a lot of groups are still trying to work on that. Google said that goal's in the rear view mirror, what's next? And of course, 100% renewable energy is something that really relies on accounting the way it's um, set in practice today, which is you can buy a bunch of wind and solar. And as long as the megawatt hours add up in your supply column and equal your demand column at the end of the year, you say that's good to go. But what Google said is that, you know, we've achieved that goal. We set out, we were a leader there. What's next? And have taken on this new initiative, which is 24 seven carbon free energy. And as I've talked about before, it's a very different problem because you can't just average out over a year matching every hour of every uh, of demand um, all across the year is a very challenging problem and one in which geothermal can shine. Uh, and it was actually Google's public announcements around getting serious about 24 seven carbon free energy that kind of put out a big billboard for us at Fervo and said, we've got to go talk to them because this is the customer who gets it. This is a group that's on the forefront of thinking about sustainability and they're going to understand the importance of driving new technology solutions to the table and how valuable geothermal can be. So we worked with them for a long time, very excited about the partnership that we announced with them earlier this year, where we're gonna work on supplying them with geothermal power for their, for their projects um, going forward. And as well, we're also focusing with them on new collaborations around bringing a lot of Google's capabilities in terms of AI and, and, and machine learning to the table to better understand and characterize the subsurface for some of the challenges that we have in geothermal. So. We're seeing engagement from new players. As Jamie said, it's coming from investors, it's coming from corporates, it's coming from policymakers that are looking at the world in a new lens and understanding uh, the challenges we have in front of us and how geothermal actually has a very important role to play in this. And it's truly across the board that we're seeing more recognition from all the different stakeholders and the energy ecosystem about the growing relevance of geothermal power to achieving our, our sustainability goals. So when you were talking about this partnership that you developed with Google, you know, something that I caught upon was that there was, it was important to choose the right partner as well. Choosing a, a company that was at the forefront of sustainability, that was also at the forefront of technology. Um, and they also had a set of technologies that, you know, you could potentially leverage to improve your own operations. Um, I want to turn things over to Lise. So Schlumberger has recently entered or recently stood up two geothermal um, companies. 
or joint ventures. So these are partnerships. What did you, you know, what was your thought process in entering into a partnership to do this? You know, Schlumberger is a, you know, very well-funded company, very well-established. You probably could have done it on your own. Why the well, like, partnership? Yeah, like I said um, uh, on one of the the earlier uh, questions, I think that in a in an environment where you have limited capex as well as uncertainty around what the the long term opportunity landscape really looks like or a high degree of uncertainty, I think the partnership approach is the the way to go, and that's certainly the the approach we've taken in the geothermal space. The, for example, we have the the geothermal power. Um, uh, partnership geoframe and in that case you know we we've said we've come with the, this extensive knowledge of the subsurface and drilling and then we've partnered with thermal energy partners who have the experience in you know project management and, and uh, managing large geothermal power projects so like you said kind of both bringing their expertise to the table um, to ultimately uh, leverage like you said limited capex and, and uh, quicker access of the returns. Um, you also have another partnership or another um, geothermal joint venture. Um, what's, you know, so is this, it, are so they both the same or what's what's the no, difference? So the, the, uh, the other is a closed loop heating and cooling. Um, so, uh, you know, shallow Celsius energy is the name of this one. And so this one, again, looking for local partners, um, in the, the space to be able to um, leverage. Actually, Tim talked about it earlier. So it, what would have, for a, it's our menu, our demonstrator project is our manufacturing facility um, in one of our manufacturing facilities in France and would have ordinarily taken a, a, a surface installation, let's say the size of a, an American football field. And we've done it in, in the spot of, you know, let's say two parking spaces. Um, the, it's been up and running fully operational since December and you know, going to this proof point uh, that we talked about earlier, we we are seeing like a 60% reduction in energy consumption or energy draw and a 90% reduction in emissions. So, you know, a real uh, example. And I think that, you know, on the last question, speaking to the uh, the press releases and the kind of the connection and the, the image, the, the tactic we took on the surface, we engaged an, a, an artist, a French artist, to design the surface infrastructure. And it looks like a park. It's very colorful. It's very zen. And, and so, you know, the, you know, the earlier conversation about maybe why, why suddenly the, or what are the barriers? The consumer connection to geothermal, I think, is probably one of the things that lags behind solar and wind. And um, I think that the good press, but also these sort of when you talk about really a, a solution that has a, a minimal footprint that really is, you know, a, a, a base load source option. I think that with a, a PR, an industry wide PR theme that that talks about that, I think we could leverage that consumer connection in a way um, that really helps uptake as well. So. You know, one thing that I, I want to, I guess, explore is that, you know, there might be a little bit of confusion out there regarding geothermal. You know, there are, you know, there's a geothermal for heating, but there's also geothermal for power generation. And, you know, we're really discussing, you know, the role that geothermal has for power generation. And in the public sphere, um, you know, how do you, you know, educate people more, on, on the role that geothermal plays. Um, Jamie, your organization is also looking at, um, you know, trying to advance um, both in the public um, public sphere of, you know, geo, you know, the benefits of geothermal energy and you know, why the opportunity is ripe. Um, I know you engage with a number of media outlets, you know, is it, do you find that there is still that challenge Oh yeah, yeah, confusion. absolutely. And and it's funny, even very high information people are, you know, people that really know, for instance, in the oil and gas industry that think they know this stuff are, are still often confused, right? And so, it, you know, there's the problem between heat and power production, but there's really a problem between in the power production space between scalable and non-scalable. So most people think geothermal, oh yeah, that's Iceland, irrelevant. It's geographically limited. And I mean, in the oil and gas industry, I mean, there's still folks that, you know, have these biases. 
and you really have to work at it to to explain how technology development has really enabled geothermal to be developed in many more places vastly more places if not anywhere in the world um, and that we really have a set of incremental incremental technology challenges to drive costs down and so i mean just high information people that's a struggle with the general public it's it's very very difficult so um you know uh, yes, I've, I've definitely made it a goal with my organization, with, with conferences and with, with media spots to, to reach out to everyone. And the difficult part there is um, when you're trying to educate everyone, you can't use a single message. And so there are, um, there are a lot of strategies that need to happen when you're speaking to the right versus the left, for instance. Um, you have to use different sets of tech, you know, terminologies to get people to feel like they can accept what you're saying. Um, you know, high information and then general public that just knows, you know, renewables, but, you know, that's about it. It sounds good. You know, that, you know, it's, there's different, um, there's different ways of tackling it. And it's a complex problem that needs a lot more help. There needs to be a lot more stakeholders engaged with this governments and philanthropies. And I mean, there needs to be, um, vastly more effort. So the general public for one um, when they think of wind and solar, they also think of geothermal. It needs to be ubiquitous and in people's minds where, you know, geothermal is part of the clean energy solutions of the future instead of, oh yeah, that's Iceland, which is what you still encounter, you know, a large majority of the time in speaking with folks about geothermal. Amazingly, even within high information circles like the oil and gas industry. Yeah. So it's definitely a set of challenges. It, if I could just add to that for a second, it, everything that Jamie said is true, but the thing that I found is this is a, a story that is just demanding to be told. And when the word gets out there, people are very enthusiastic about this. And I think levels of awareness of geothermal are, are still very low. You know, I work in the industry, in the energy industry. I was a drilling engineer at an oil and gas company, and I discovered geothermal because I was benchmarking high temperature drilling solutions because of some challenges we were having in the Haynesville and Eagleford. And if it wouldn't have been for that, I would have never been aware of it. And then I, I lived in the San Francisco Bay Area for years, and you're less than an hour drive away from a resource that produces 20% of California's renewable electricity, as you, as you said in the intro. And a lot of people don't have any awareness that there's even geothermal in California. Uh, so you're either not aware of it at all, or you have a low level of awareness. But when the word gets out there, it just catches fire, and people are so passionate about it. It was interesting to see yesterday, if you've been following the news, um, you know, the president of El Salvador announced uh, they're, they're making big moves in Bitcoin and also that they're going to use the country's volcanoes to power uh, geothermal power for, for Bitcoin mining. And I went through and read the comments and it was fascinating. The story went all over the world. Everyone's fascinated by this. And El Salvador has been producing geothermal for a long, long time. It's just people didn't know about it. And you go and read the, com the comments and everyone, like I saw the mind blown emoji in every single comment where it's like, you can get electricity from volcanoes. And I've been like, yes, we've been doing this for a hundred years. But whenever the word gets out there, it captivates people. And that's one thing that excites me about it. We've got to do a better job of telling the story, but it's a story that is demanding to be told. I agree. And 100%. it's something that is ready to, to get out there and, and change the world. So maybe geothermal is too good of a renewable energy resource because, you know, it's not creating these you know, vast, um, you know, farm, solar farm arrays, which are taking up a lot of land or, um, you know, windmills that are off the, off, you know, offshore that people can see, you know, it, it's almost like the under the radar um, renewable resource. Um, you know, you mentioned, um, you know, we, we've heard a lot about this technology coming from the oil and gas industry, but, you um, you know, geothermal also marries the uh, electricity sector, the power generation sector. So have we seen, um, you know, technology advances in the power sector um, in geothermal, uh, you know, geothermal generation that have evolved as, you know, the um, renewable energy uh, sector has those technologies like wind and solar, how they've evolved by making the grid you know, more inter, you know, the, the supply more intermittent by making the grid um, more distributed. Have we seen something, um, you know, some, a, a similar evolution in the technology on the, the power side? 
Go, Tim, get, you go first and then I'll follow. I'll, I'll hit a couple of points. One is something that's very exciting in the world of geothermal that I wouldn't call it a new tech, but it's a newer tech, is there's been big advancements in the last couple of decades in binary cycle power generation for geothermal power, which opens up an entirely new class of lower temperature resource. So you don't actually have to drill to 600 degrees Fahrenheit anymore. You can drill to 300 degrees Fahrenheit and have it work. And so 95% of the new capacity of geothermal that's been built in the US since 2000 has been with this binary cycle technology. And it's opening up where geothermal can be. And we're seeing big advancements there, both by traditional players like Ormat and Turboden, and also from new startups um, like, like Climon. And so there's a lot of advancements there where the power facilities are getting much better. The other thing is that people, the grid is changing so, so rapidly that people start, aren't quite adapting to what's different now. And I can tell you, if you go back in the United States 20 years ago or 10 years ago, everyone was concerned about meeting the peak daytime summer electricity demand when your AC load was the highest and everything had to be on. And geothermal actually struggles a little bit there because our plant efficiency is based off of the ambient temperature. So when it gets higher temperature, the plant efficiency actually goes down, down a little bit. So you can see a dip sometimes on hot days. 10 or 20 years ago, that was a major ding against geothermal. And we had to over-design plants to try to meet that daytime uh, capacity in the middle of the summer when people needed it. Well, the grid is different now. Solar is so cheap and so ubiquitous. Buyers actually do, are not concerned at all about that cheap daytime electricity. And a thing that we used to get really hurt on, which is we don't have that high efficiency for the um, middle of the summer, is actually something that's great now. Buyers are like, oh, we can buy power from you and it's concentrated in evenings and nighttime, whenever we can complement our, our, our existing portfolio. And that's gone from a negative to a plus. And the grid is really dynamic and geothermal is benefiting from this as well. So we've got better technology so that through these binary cycle plants. Not only can they be lower temperature, they can be more flexible, which is a big important thing for the grid today. And we have a changing grid that is changing in just the right way to make geothermal power even more valuable than it used to be. And so there's a lot of really exciting things that are happening from a technology grid surface facility standpoint that are continuing to drive this trend forward as well. So, and then what's coming down the pike on that too is, is really cool. There's a lot that can be tweaked with, with binary and organic, organic rank and cycle turbines in the next couple of years, but, but what's coming down the pike is pretty cool too. You're looking at uh, companies looking at using engineered working fluids that are non-water based, um, that have lower supercritical points. So essentially same point that Tim made, you can, you don't have to drill as far, you don't have to drill as hot to get the same output. So using supercritical CO2 as a working fluid, supercritical CO2 turbines tend to be a lot smaller than traditional turbines. So you have downsized power plants. And then you have companies that are, you know, a, a, a growing number of them now pursuing thermoelectric generation for geothermal, where you can actually have electricity generation located in the subsurface and you are shipping electrons to the surface already ready to go onto the grid. So no surface power plant at all. So that means geothermal essentially becomes zero footprint. And that is the kind of thing that, wow, let's see about that in 10 years, because that could be incredible. You know, you could put geothermal right in the center of cities with zero footprint, for instance. Um, so, so really exciting things coming down the pike, a lot of technology innovation. Now that there are more, you know, more and more brains joining the race, you're starting to see kind of these new concepts, um, you know, come into the come into the fore. So it's really it's some, something the, the top sides part of geothermal power production is something to really watch mm -hmm. in terms of changes in technology development. Yeah, so so that is is a really exciting development. It's almost like the, you know, how we we um, seen, you know, offshore development going from, you know, you know, surface on the platforms to uh, to subsea. So we're taking quite a lot of um, you know, concepts and new thinking that has really driven the um, and, and transformed the oil and gas industry and taking that to transform um, the geothermal industry as well. So uh, with that note, I think, um, you know, we end on a, a fantastic, um, you know, uh, message of optimism that there is, um, you know, a lot of new technology coming down the pipeline to really change the game of geothermal, um, to you know, potentially drive um, you know, greater scaling and greater deployment of this technology. But at the same time, you know, we have existing capabilities 
that can easily be transferred. Uh, we have supply chains and technology partners that can um, shepherd us through this, uh, this transition to grow geothermal. So, you know, I think we have, you know, things to look forward to, but there are definitely activities that we can, um, you know, do now to advance geothermal. So with that note, I would like to thank uh, my panelists for a great conversation on what's driving this new revival and um, where we think it's gonna lead. But I'd also like to thank you, the audience, for joining us for this Zero Week Innovation Agora conversation. Thank you. <laughs>